There we are. Good morning. Glad that you're here. We shall go ahead and get started by inviting everybody. Let's go ahead. Inviting Jimmy. Inviting Debbie. Who else do we have over here in our little peanut gallery? Let's see. Let's add in Carol. And we're going to add in Kathy. And we're going to invite Grandma Linda, who I left her picture. I don't think she'll mind. I left her picture down at my son, Sean and Ashley. Sean and my daughter in love Ashley's house. So she's down there. I don't have her picture to show you this morning. But so we've invited our peoples, and I'm sure they're going to start joining us. Good morning, Carol. Glad that you're here. We're going to go ahead and open in prayer. Hi, Carol. Lord, I just thank you for this day. I thank you for your word. I thank you that we can get back into your word, and it is here for us, and it is new, and it is live, and it gives us new meaning and purpose each and every day. Lord, I thank you that you are the God that speaks to us, that you care about us, and that you have a word for us today, and help us to hear it, understand it, and apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty, so here we go. We're starting in 2 Samuel 14, and we're on Absalom returns to Jerusalem. Now, Joab, the son of Zeruiah, knew that the king's heart went out to Absalom, king being David, Absalom being one of his sons. And Joab, Joab sent it to Koa and brought from there a wise woman and said to her, Pretend to be a mourner and put on mourning garments. Do not anoint yourself with oil, but behave like a woman who has been mourning many days for the dead. Go to the king and speak thus to him. So Joab put the words in her mouth. Now we'll see what that means. When the woman of Tekoa came to the king, she fell on her face to the ground and paid homage and said, Save me, O king. And the king said to her, What is your trouble? And she answered, Alas, I am a widow. My husband is dead, and your servant had two sons. And they quarreled with one another in the field, and there was no one to separate them, and one struck the other and killed them. And now the whole clan is risen against your servant, and they say, Give up the man who struck his brother, that we may put him to death for the life of his brother whom he killed. And so they would destroy the heir also. Thus they would quench my coal that is left and leave to my husband neither name nor remnant on the face of the earth. Then the king said to the woman, Go to your house, and I will give orders concerning you. And the woman of Tekoa said to the king, On me be the guilt, my lord the king, and on my father's house, that the king and his throne be guiltless. The king said, If anyone says anything to you, bring him to me, and he shall never touch you again. Then she said, Please let the king invoke the Lord your God, that the avenger of blood kill no more, and my son not be destroyed. And he said, As the Lord lives, not one hair of your son shall fall to the ground. And then the woman said, Please let your servant speak a word to my lord the king. And he said, Speak. And the woman said, Why then have you planned such an evil thing against the people of God? For in giving this decision, the king convicts himself, and as much as the king does not bring his banished one home again, we must all die. We are all like spilt, like water spilled on the ground, which cannot be gathered up again. But God will not take away life, and he devises means so that the banished one will not remain an outcast. And now I have come to say this to my lord, the king, because the people have made me afraid, and your servant thought, I will speak to the king. It may be that the king will perform the request of his servant. Good morning, Randy. Glad that you're here. Yeah, I understand running for coffee, Carol. No worries. Go ahead, and I'll be back. I'll be right here. So for, in verse 16, for the king will hear and deliver his servant from the hand of the man who would destroy me and my son together from the heritage of God. And your servant thought, the word of my lord, the king, will set me at rest. For my Lord, the King, is like the angel of God, let's turn that off, to discern good and evil. The Lord your God be with you. So she was told to speak this by Joab. She was told to speak this in a way that David might see it and understand that what he was doing was not okay and that he needed to be right with God. His disagreement and his argument with Absalom was not okay. and so. 
this is why this whole story takes place. There, of course, is no story. The whole thing is just made up by Joab so he can get David's attention to ch change his way of thinking. So then the king answered the woman, Do not hide from me anything I ask you. And the woman said, Let my lord the king speak. And the king said, Is the hand of Joab with you in all this? <laughs> so David knew exactly who put her up to it. And the woman answered and said, As surely as you live, my lord the king, you cannot turn to the right hand or to the left from anything that my lord the king has said. It was your servant Joab who commanded me. It was he who put all these words in the mouth of your servant. In order to change the course of things, your servant Joab did this. But my lord has wisdom, like the wisdom of the angel of God, to know all things that are on the earth. She's, she's telling him this so she doesn't get in trouble. But truly, David did know what was going on and knew exactly who had put her up to it. So he wasn't angry with the woman by any means, but it was on Joab. So then the king said to Joab, so now he's calling him, and behold, now I grant this, go, bring back the young man Absalom. And Joab fell on his face to the ground and paid homage and blessed the king. And Joab said, today your servant knows that I have found favor in, my, in your sight, my lord the king, and that the king has granted the request of his servant. So Joab arose and went to Geshur and brought Absalom to Jerusalem. And the king said, let him dwell apart in his own house. He is not to come into my presence. So Absalom lived apart in his own house and did not come into the king's presence. Now, because we had a few days that we missed, you might not know the reasoning as to why Absalom was separated from David. Why was Absalom not allowed to live in King David's presence? And we see that. Let's see. Absalom. How did Absalom wrong King David? Okay, so what did he do wrong? So we can Google it, because that's the easiest if you don't know the story. And let's see. Absalom was David's third son, the, the child of his fourth wife, Maka of Geshur. She was a princess of Geshur in a small Armenian kingdom northeast of the Sea of Galilee. No doubt David's marriage to her was the cement of political alliance. So David had eight wives and seven sons by the time we reach chapter 13 of 2 Samuel. So we see there's definitely jealousy and conflict between everybody. David was acting like the kings of the ancient Middle East whose reputation and power could be measured in the terms of the number and beauty and power of his wives as well as the number of their sons. But he's acting against the express command of God he must not take many wives or his heart may be led astray. So David failed to deal with Ammon's violation of Absalom's sister. Now we missed that story. So to recap on that, Amnon was one of his sons and Amnon decided he liked his half sister and Amnon decided he was going to take her. So instead of asking David for his half sister in marriage, which Probably was not the best thing, but better than what he did. He raped her. And after he raped her, he threw her out. And so pretty much she was disgraced. She was ruined. And Absalom took her back and took care of her. Now, David did nothing. David did not discipline his son. David did not care for his daughter. David did not thank Absalom for taking his daughter in. I mean, nothing. David did absolutely nothing in this situation, so therefore Absalom felt he needed to step up and do something about this, so he killed his half-brother Amnon. Well, by doing that, he caused David to get mad at him for, I don't know, pretty much stepping up and doing what he should have did. I mean, maybe David didn't need to have killed Amnon, but he should have did something. And because he did nothing, Absalom felt he had to do something, so he did, and that's what he did, and then he was banished. And now David is saying he can come back, but he doesn't want to see him. So that's the story recap as to where we're at and why we're where we're at, okay? 
So we'll go back, and now we're in verse 25. So now in all Israel, there was no one so much to be praised for his handsome appearance as Absalom. And if you remember before, it was David who was praised and um, had a good appearance. And so now things have turned. So now Absalom, his son, is the one that has this great appearance. And from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head, there was no blemish on him. And when he cut the hair of his head, for at the end of every year he used to cut it, when it was heavy on him, he cut it. He weighed the hair of his head two hundred shekels by the weight of the king by the king's weight. There were born to Absalom three sons and one daughter whose name was Tamar. She was a beautiful woman. So he evidently was a good looking man and he had good looking kids. That was important, evidently, because it's named here. So Absalom lived two full years in Jerusalem without coming into the king's presence. Then Absalom sent for Joab to send him to the king, but Joab would not come to him. And he sent a second time, but Joab would not come. And then he said to his servant, See, Joab's field is next to mine, and he is barely there. Go and set it on fire. So Absalom's servant set the field on fire. And then Joab arose and went to Absalom at his house and said, Why have your servants set my field on fire? And Absalom answered Joab, Behold, I sent word to you, Come here, that I may send you to the king to ask, Why have I come from Geshur? It would be better for me to be there still. And now therefore let me go into the presence of the king, and if there is guilt on me, let him put me to death. So Absalom gets tired of waiting to see King David. He's calling Joab, the servant, to come. Hi, Mom, Lind, I love you. Um, he's calling Joab to come and go before the king. Joab doesn't listen. So Absalom sets Joab's field on fire, which is kind of a little extreme, but evidently that's, he sounds kind of extreme. So he goes, he sets the field on fire, and then Joab finally comes, and then Joab is then forced to have to deal with Absalom. Absalom doesn't want to wait anymore in this place. He wants to go back to his hometown. But because of the king telling him he had to go there, he couldn't just leave. He had to be allowed to leave. So then Joab went to the king and told him, and he summoned Absalom. So now David is allowing Absalom to come into his presence. So he came into the king, came to the king and bowed himself on his face to the ground before the king, and the king kissed Absalom. Didn't say anything, didn't discipline him, didn't deal with the situation, didn't deal with him trying to take over the kingdom, didn't do anything, just allowed him to come back, gave him a kiss. Hey, everything's okay. It's been a few years. We're all good. Just let it go. You know, this is not the best course of way to deal with any kind of situation because you're not really dealing with the situation. You're just kind of overlooking it, which really... You know, when you overlook your health and you just allow that cancer to grow and grow and grow, it just takes over and eventually it will kill you. And that's what's going on right here. So we see in chapter 15, after this, Absalom got himself a chariot and horses and 50 men to run before him. And Absalom used to rise early and stand beside the way of the gate. And when any man had a dispute to come before the king for judgment, Absalom will call to him and say, From what city are you? And when he said, Your servant is of such and such a tribe in Israel, Absalom would say to him, See, your claims are good and right, but there is no man designated by the king to hear you. See, he's turning the hearts of the people. He's getting up early, standing at the gate, and dis distracting the people from going before the king to instead hear his bad words, his words of, you know, causing them to not want to go before the king, but to just listen to him. So Absalom would say, see, your claims are good and right. So then in verse 4, then Absalom would say, oh, that I were the judge in the land. Then every man with a dispute or cause might come to me, and I would give them justice. Because I'm, uh, I'm just sitting around here, you know, I'm wide open, I'm available. But you know the king, you, you might not even get to see the king. But here I am. And that's what Absalom's doing. Absalom's turning the hearts of the people away from David because, one, he's getting up early. Because, two, he's catching them before they can see the king. So thus Absalom did to all of Israel who came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel.
Now, David could have also been getting up early, could have also been watching for the heart for the people coming towards him, could have made sure that that situation wasn't happening, could have made sure that the people coming into the city were not led astray by anyone, but he was not. He was not because he had got laxed in his judgment of, for the people, in his ruling of the people, and he had not he was not fulfilling what he should have been doing, hence why Absalom was able to do this in the first place. So, and at the end of four years, Absalom said to the king, please let me go and pay my vow, which I have vowed to the Lord in Hebron. For your servant vowed a vow, which while I lived in Geshur and Aram, saying, if the Lord will indeed bring me back to Jerusalem, then I will offer worship to the Lord. So the king said to him, go in peace. So he arose and went to Hebron, which is a lie. So he's using the name of God and worship for God as a lie to leave David's presence. And now he's plotting. He's plotting against King David. All of this is just part of train up a child in the way they should go, right? If David had been on top of his kids, if David had been on top of his wives, if David had not taken so many wives like the people around him, he would not be in this situation. But yes, he did. And no, he was not in control of his family. And yes, his family was now causing his kingdom to be divided. And here we go. So Absalom sent secret messengers throughout all the tribes of Israel saying, as soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then say, Absalom is king at Hebron. So with Absalom went 200 men from Jerusalem who were invited guests and they went to the, in their innocence and knew nothing. And while Absalom was offering the sacrifices, he went for, he sent for Ahithophel, the Gileanite, and David's counselor from his city in Gilo. And the conspiracy grew strong and the people with Absalom kept increasing. So this is what happens when you allow something to go unchecked. When you don't deal with the problems that are at hand, the problems become overwhelming. And that's what's happening right here. So David is now having to flee Jerusalem in on verse 13. And a messenger came to David saying, the hearts of the men of Israel have gone after Absalom. Then David said to all his servants who were with him at Jerusalem, arise and let us flee or else there will be no escape for us from Absalom. Go quickly, lest he overtake us quickly and bring down ruin on us and strike the city with the edge of the sword. And the king's servant said to the king, behold, your servants are ready to do whatever my lord the king decides. Now they're giving him the option. We don't have to flee. I mean, this is your son after all. You're the king. You know, we don't have to run. Right? So the king went out and all his household after him, and the king left ten concubines to keep the house. And the king went out and all the people after him, and they halted at the last house. And all his servants passed by him, and all the Cherethites, and all the Pelethites, and all the 600 Gittites who had followed him from Gath passed on before the king. And then the king said to Ittai the Gittite, why do you also go with us? Go back and stay with the king, for you are a foreigner, also an exile from your home. You came only yesterday, and shall I today make you wander about with us since I go? I know not where. Go back and take your brothers with you, and may the Lord show steadfast love and faithfulness to you. But Ittai answered the king, as the Lord lives and my Lord the king lives, wherever my Lord the king shall be, whether for death or for life, there also your servant will be. And David said to Ittai, go then pass on. So Ittai the Gittite passed on with all his men and all the little ones who were with him. Evidently, Ittai the Gittite knew exactly who the king was. And even though David refers to stay with the king, refers to Absalom as king, Ittai knows who the real king is. Even though David is not willing to step up and be who God has called him to be, the people that are true to God know who David is supposed to be and are standing behind him. 
you know, sometimes we lose focus and lose heart as to what God's purpose and calling is on our lives because we are divided in our vision and purpose because of the things we allow in our lives. And possibly David's vision and purpose was divided at this point due to all of the wives and children that he had. He could have changed the course of this action, which would have probably saved Absalom, which would have probably saved his kingdom a lot of heartache. But instead, he let himself run away from his problems instead of dealing with his problems. Instead of facing them, talking them out, and working through it, he allowed the problem to run him off. And that's where we leave David today. So then we go on to our New Testament reading in John 18. And we're on the betrayal and arrest of Jesus. So in Chapter 18 of John, verse 1, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? And they said to him, or they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. And when Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. It's a great statement to show the power and majesty of God. And Jesus Christ, being the Son of God, when he says, I am he, and they fall out, this is the same God in the burning bush that when Moses says, well, who shall I say sent me? And, and God tells them through the burning bush, tell them, I am who I am. I am has sent you to them. I am, because God is the great I am. And Jesus is now saying, I am he. And just by saying these words, they fall out on the ground. It's a great picture right there of who God is and who God is through Jesus Christ, his son. In verse 7, so he asked them again, whom do you seek? Like, hello, hello, get up off the ground, you know. And they said, Jesus of Nazareth, let's stand up and brush the dirt off since now we've just fallen down at his words. And Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. Because even in his being taken into custody, Jesus is still in charge. Jesus is still giving direction. Jesus is still caring for his disciples. This was to fulfill the word he had spoken of those whom you gave me. I have lost not one. So then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. And so Jesus said to Peter, put your sword in its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? Peter, so impetuous, so willing to step up, so willing to do what he thought was right at the moment, just cuts off this guy's ear. Now, we don't see it here. But in the other Gospels, we see that Jesus immediately picks up the ear and heals the servant, his last miracle. So we'll go on. Jesus faces Annas and Caiaphas. So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. Only because Jesus allowed them to, he laid down his life. He handed himself over. No one took him. No one took his life. His life was freely given up. He was not, he was not without the ability to stop that situation. He allowed everything to happen the way it did for you, for me, for the love that he had for both of us. Good morning, uh, Bethany. Good morning, Benny. Glad that you guys are here. So, we see that there he goes, he's bound, and first they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. And it was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. So Caiaphas was not above understanding what was going on with Jesus being as powerful he, as he was among the people. Caiaphas understood, 630 for you guys that are needing to know, Caiaphas understood 
that Jesus was becoming a force to be reckoned with. And instead of allowing this situation to continue, it would be more beneficial for this one person to die than all of them to die because in their mind, he was leading a revolution. In their mind, he was trying to go against the Roman government. In their mind, he was trying to lead a rebellion. And they didn't understand that he was really the Christ, the Son of God. They missed the fact that he was the Messiah. Okay, so Peter denies Jesus. So Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Now, we're in the book of John. That other disciple is John the disciple, not John the Baptist. And... Um, he never names himself. He always calls himself the one Jesus loved or the other disciple. So since that disciple was known to the high priest, John, he entered with Jesus into the court of the high priest. But Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, you also are not one of this... You also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? So nobody questions John who went in and asked for them to bring Peter in, evidently because he was known to the high priest. But immediately she questions who Peter is. And he says, I am not. First time. He is denying who Christ is. Now the servants and the officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold and they were standing and warming themselves and Peter was also with them standing and warming himself because he was warming himself at the fire of those that were trying to kill Jesus, trying to condemn the Son of God, right? And he was trying to find comfort there. Right? So the high priest questions Jesus. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. You know, I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who've heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. And when he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Now Jesus answered him, if what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. You know, when you're right and you're standing on the word of God and you are doing what he's asked you to do, you know, no one can fault you. And if they do fault you, the fault is not on you they're faulting God. They're faulting what you're standing for. They're faulting the truth that you stand for and on and behind and, and with, right? Jesus has, is not speaking lies. He's speaking truth, but he does, they don't want to hear the truth that he's speaking because they want to condemn him. And that's where we're going to leave Jesus for today. And we're going to go into Psalms 119, 97 through 112. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the aged, for I keep your precepts. I hold back my feet from every evil way in order to keep your word. Are we holding back? So we can keep God's word or do we rush forward into the evil that's set before us and then say, sorry, 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 sorry. You know, a lot of times it's, it's easier to say and ask for forgiveness than to ask for, permi for permission, right? And so I do not turn aside from your rules for you have taught me how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. You only know a way is false by understanding the precepts that are set down to guide you in the way that is correct. And if you don't understand what those precepts are, then you're bound to go in the way that is false. And Jesus is, or God's word is telling us, you know, you have the word here. You know, you have the ability to know what is true and right and good 
follow it, right? Verse 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I have sworn an oath and confirmed it to keep your righteous rules. I'm severely afflicted. Give me life, O Lord, according to your word. Accept my free will offerings of praise, O Lord, and teach me your rules. I hold my life in my hand continually, but I do not forget your law. The wicked have laid a snare for me, but I do not stray from your precepts. Do you see that if you do not stray from the precepts of God, the snares of the wicked around you will not ensnare you because you're following the precepts God has laid for you. You cannot be ensnared by those that are around you if you're in the way God has led you, right? Your testimonies are my heritage forever for they are the joy of my heart. I incline my heart to perform your statutes forever to the end you know psalms is a beautiful way of understanding that god's word is true and right and perfect and able to guide and direct us in every and any situation and that we can be real with god and we can share who where we are with god and god understands and god accepts us where we're at and we can give him honor and glory even in the hard times and that finishes Psalms, and we end in Proverbs 16, 8 through 9. Better is a little with righteousness than great revenues with injustice. And I would say, you know, there's, there's lots of people in this day and age that their sole main purpose and focus is to accumulate great revenues. But the way they get there is through injustice, and it won't be blessed. It won't be honored. And great revenues can't be taken with you throughout eternity. To have just a little bit and to have the righteousness of God within you, for you, behind you, around you is far more valuable because that is eternal value, right? So the heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. It doesn't say the heart of a man sits and waits for God to drop his illustrious plan in your lap. And until God does drop his plan in your lap, you just sit in the road and wait for it to come. No, you have to plan your way. You have to plan what the direction and course of action will be. And then what does the Lord say he does? He establishes your steps. He says, yes, you have planned this. But now I'm going to direct you in the way you should get there, if that's the place you should get at all. But because you have made plans, before, because you have sought me, because you have chose to follow what you feel is my will, I will continue to guide your steps. I will continue to establish who you are. I will continue to help you get in the way that you need to go. That is who God is. God is there to help and guide you. God is not just going to drop things in your lap. And we are not called to just wait and do nothing. We're called to be active. We're called to, to be involved in God's plan. God doesn't want you to sit in a corner and wait for him to throw something in your lap. God wants you to plan how you're going to use and do and grow in the gifts that he's given you. What are you doing with your time and your tithe and your talent? God wants you to use who you are and he wants you to plan how you can do that. And then he wants you, then he wants to guide and direct you in the way to get there. And maybe not there, maybe another direction. But he can't guide you if you're not going. You know, GPS doesn't work unless you leave your driveway. And the GPS is on and running. God's word is your GPS. If you choose to not follow it, it can reroute. It might take you a long time. But, you know, God has a perfect plan for you. And as you follow in that plan of what God's will for your life is, he will continue to guide your steps. Your GPS is not going to work. God's word is not going to work unless you make a plan and you follow it. Allow God to follow. Allow yourself to follow God's plan for your life today. And you can know what that plan is by being in the word, by being in prayer, by being in fellowship, by sharing God's word, by accepting God's word from those that are right and true with God, by being surrounded by fellow Christians. I, I implore you 
to seek God today, to seek God's word. And if you missed any part of this, I know mom came in late, have PT again, physical therapy. I'm here now. Perfect, Jackie. I'm glad that you were able to join in. Um, I gave a little recap in the beginning of Absalom and Amnon and uh, King David in our Old Testament reading. So if you missed that, I really suggest you hear the beginning part because we missed it for the last few days. Good morning, Raquel. I'm so glad that you're here. And I hope that you're able to uh, rewind and catch the whole teaching. Thank you guys so much for joining us. And I hope you have a super blessed day. And I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Talk to you guys later.